Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Clinton. How are you today? I am wonderful. How are you doing, Michael? I'm really great. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast all the way from the USA. And currently, I believe you're in Texas right now. <laughs> yes, Austin, Texas. Keeping it weird in Austin. If you've ever been there, they're known for being weird. <laughs> Are they? <laughs> yes. I have been to Texas. Um, and the state is just huge. I just remember driving for hours on end and it just took forever to get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a it is a huge state. It's bigger than a lot of countries. Absolutely. Yes. It's it's very, very large. But it's was nice. It was always warm and sunny. And but I did drive through some huge thunderstorms, probably the biggest thunderstorms I've ever experienced. I literally had to stop the car underneath a bridge for it to subside. I just couldn't see anything on the motorway, on the highway. <laughs> it was just so dangerous. And it was like, oh, man, I have never forgotten it. It's the worst thunderstorm. And it was in Texas. <laughs> yeah, they can rival some storms down in South Africa. And Arizona has really big thunderstorms as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a fact. Big hail, big hail yeah. ball yeah. come down. Absolutely. Like tennis balls, I'm sure. <laughs> Right, Clinton, I, I, I'm really curious and interested to hear your story. So I'm just going to ask you, please share with us your story. How did it all get started and how did you get to where you are today? And then we'll deep dive into the amazing things that you're doing right now. And yeah, I'm going to hand it over to you and I'm just going to listen. Wow, that's a pretty ginormous question i have to say michael it's a very big question i could start in many many different places um, i'm going to kind of start where i am now and then go back and then come back forward because it, it i think it really speaks to the heart of what i'm about to share and that is that um, you know we're all on our journeys and i am definitely somebody who uh has always followed my intuition. Before I even knew what intuition was, I would be someone as a, as a, even a young kid, like I would just feel something and I would just go and do it, right? For, for those of us who are maybe not aware what intuition is, or just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'll give you a real rudimentary uh, definition. And that is to just be, it's really a, uh, not a conscious reasoning, but more of a, just a feeling, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not like we're thinking about it necessarily. It's just this feeling um, that comes through and it just feels right. And whenever I've had those, even again, as a, as a child, I would do them and it would always seem to work out. It doesn't mean it was always perfect. It doesn't mean no. that uh, there wasn't challenges or it, it was exactly what I thought it was going to be. In fact, sometimes it's not what I thought it was going to be, but it's even better. Right. Yeah. So uh, so I'd always been somebody that did that, even through to uh, later on in life. I, I you know, had my first job out of university or college. And I all of a sudden said, you know what? I want to go to Singapore and go visit a friend. And I'm just going to stop. I'm just going to go. And I just went. And I didn't know why I was going, but I knew it was important. I knew something I guess I didn't know something was, it was going to lead to something, but I just mm. knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah. I knew it was the right. And, and in hindsight, now that I understand intuition and some of the quote unquote laws of the universe and just kind of how things work uh, and how we tend to attract things that we focus on. Now I can see very clearly that I went there for a reason and yeah. it was to really ignite a passion for culture and to really moved me into something that I had wanted to do previously, which was go to grad school. So I came back from Singapore. This was back in 2001-ish. And mm -hmm. I went, I literally quit my job and went to grad school. And I studied cross-cultural adjustment and the whole wow. process you go through when you get sent overseas on an assignment and I combine that with emotional intelligence and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to, want to bore your, your listeners and viewers with that story. But ultimately, that was an intuitive feeling that I had and I followed it and it led me to what ultimately uh, the following year would bring me to Brazil, 
studying culture now that I'm in grad school uh, and mm. then back to Singapore again uh, to continue to study the exactly what I was studying, but in having the experience of it, living overseas, not just going on vacation overseas. Uh, and that led me to what ultimately would become my dream job, which brought me to California from Massachusetts, which in the US, that's about as far away uh, as you can get from the, the, the two states are, as far yes. away from each other as you can get, except for Hawaii or Alaska. And it brought me to my dream job. And wow. so I say all that to say that, and there's a lot more that I could share going on from that, which California mm. then led me to personal development, which we were just talking about. Yes. Uh, and sort of an awakening to what was possible when I actually discovered more about myself mm. uh, with personal development, very different than academic development, right? I, yes. I feel like academic development is, is filling up, which is great. It's great to continue to, to to bring things into our mind and fill up. And I almost feel like personal development is, is taking the, some things out. It's almost like weeding a garden, taking the things wow. out that maybe aren't uh, necessary or, or that provides more clarity for you to see through the trees, if you will, of what really is there. I feel yeah. like that's more of a sort of an analogy of what, what I've experienced with personal development. So that whole decision to go to Singapore led me to dream job, personal development, my first business as an entrepreneur, uh, my wife, right? And yes. a whole new experience of feeling alive. Now that, and that's 2008, 2006, seven and eight, five, six, seven and eight. So a lot of things have happened since then. Mm. In 2008, as you probably are aware, most people, there was a massive financial collapse, right? In the world. Uh, yes. I'm here in the U.S. It was definitely very apparent in the U.S. And I had a very challenging few years, right? I went from my first business, uh, my first time ever making six figures, first business being fairly successful, uh, being involved and immersed in personal development, really feeling like I was feeling alive, had a lot of yes. time flexibility. From that to losing my business, uh, losing my credit score, um, and really my confidence was absolutely shattered. Lost my property. Mm. Right? 2008 was a very, very, very dark year for me and for, of course, many others, but definitely for me. Confidence yes. was absolutely shattered. And I find myself uh, walking into a broke down call center. Okay. Broke yeah. down call center, literally getting ready to take on a job where I'm calling local schools, uh, I'm sorry, local businesses to mm. raise money and sell advertising in high school sports calendars, making right. $8 an hour, mm. okay? So going from making six figures and having all this time flexibility and a really great life and to going into this job where I was highly, highly overqualified. Of course. Um, but I had to humble myself and take on this role. And, and, you know, it was a real humbling experience, a real sobering yeah. experience. Uh, and not that there's anything wrong with that kind of job or that kind of pay. It's just, I had sort of been there, done that already. Right. And yes. so that was a really, really challenging time. And it was interesting coming back to intuition. So I feel like that is so important for anyone listening to really understand and get clear about what your intuition is, and then how to utilize it as really, a, a, I was going to say a tool, but that sounds very cold. I would say utilize it as a friend, as a confidant, as a guide right, yeah. for our lives. Yeah. And so where intuition came back up in this story is right around that time, I find myself in a seminar, Michael. And, you know, you've been through some personal development, probably yes. some workshops. And I picture yes. this, I'm in, in this room with 200 people and I'm at the microphone and I'm certainly not giving the, the speech here or the talk. I am completely lost. Okay. Mm, yeah. And the seminar leader looks right at me in front of 200 people. And he says, Clinton, you are dead inside. And I was just like, it was like a stake to my heart. Right. But yeah. at the same time, it was, he was right. 
I was glossed over. I was like the walking dead. Wow. I was dead inside. And in that moment, I, I thought I, I thought I realized why I was dead inside. And some people out there may be in a situation right now with, mm. you know, a lot of the global things going on right now. A lot of us have, you know, changed jobs, lost jobs, changed businesses. We're trying to get into maybe a new business, or maybe we're trying to start a new business from scratch right now. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity, but we may be yeah. in a place where we feel like it's not possible, or we feel like we're challenged by something. And or we might feel lost like I did. Yeah. And in that moment, I thought I realized that, Michael, I thought I had, I, I said, wow, I remember back in 2005, when I first became an entrepreneur, I also at the same time bought uh, a few properties, a few rental properties. And I thought that my intuition did it, I was like, why did my intuition let me buy those properties if it wasn't the right time? I bought them for the wrong reason, at the wrong time, completely yeah. at the top of the bubble, um, without doing enough research on the people I bought them from, on the air, everything. I was just lazy. I bought them for all the wrong reasons, thinking they were mm. going to appreciate all the stupid things that we shouldn't do, right? Or things yes. that we should consider. I was like, why did my intuition not tell me? And I was like, that's why I'm so shattered because I felt mm. like I couldn't trust my intuition anymore. Right. Okay. Very logical. It makes sense, right? It's like, that's a logical explanation of why I could be so broken at this moment. Mm. Well, fast forward about three months later, I, I like to do uh, a, some practices, one, and I call them black sheep habits. It's kind of a catchy term I've used, black sheep habits, because a black sheep sometimes stands out from the crowd, stands yes. out from the herd. And sometimes we're, we're not willing, or some of us aren't willing to do some of these habits, especially out in public, because they're not as mainstream, although they are becoming more mainstream, things like meditation, for example, yeah. right? Things like visualization, things like uh, one of the ones I was doing that day was contemplation, where I take a walk in nature. Sometimes yeah. you just take your shoes off. I'm not trying to get all hippy dippy on you here, but take your shoes off and get connected to the earth and just, just be mm. outside by yourself and you contemplate, right? And you allow your mind to uh, just be quiet. It's almost like a moving meditation or walking meditation. Whereas in meditation, we close our eyes and we, we think about hopefully nothing. And, you know, anytime a thought comes in, we release it and we, we maybe, maybe visualize either a blackness or a white light something like that as a typical meditation for, for the common person. There's a lot of different versions. Well, contemplation, if you, if you think about that, it's kind of like doing that, but you have your eyes open. Yes. Right? Thought comes in, you just release it. Thought comes in, you just release it. And you just be super, super present. It's a mm -hmm. practice of mindfulness. And yeah. what I find what happens during those experiences is, yeah, some random thoughts come up, but a lot of times a nice, uh, it's almost like a, a, a little bud comes up, sprouts up through uh, the earth, if you will, or through the, the, the ground. And it's a, it's a thought, it's an idea. It's something mm. that's really valuable, will emerge. Um, and that's what happened this day. Okay. I'm walking in nature and all of a sudden it was more like a light, Harry Potter lightning bolt hit me like right here in between my eyes. Yes. And it was Clinton. It wasn't your intuition that failed you. It was you that failed your intuition. Right. And all of these memories came back to me about my intuition telling me these are not the right people to buy this property from. They're kind of skeezy. They're asking you to do things that maybe are questionable. Um, mm. You didn't do all these thoughts were coming back to me of little signs, little warnings. And I chose in the moment, probably unconsciously, maybe consciously to ignore them yeah. because I thought I knew better. Right. I thought I, I, I want, I maybe had some greed set in. It was like, Oh, I yes. can do this. It's going to be easy. Some laziness. And, and, and that was when I really got present to what I did and not that I really did anything wrong, but I broke the trust of my intuition. It didn't mm -hmm. fail me. I failed it. And so that's why my whole model of the world seemed broken. Like if I can't trust my intuition, but wait, that means I can't trust myself. It's just like, 
oh my goodness. So it, that was really kind of ground zero, if you will. Yes. And that was the, the day that I realized that I needed to reignite my human spirit. If you know wow. a gas stove, you know, the, the old, well, even today's gas stoves, right? If you lift it up, a lot of our young people may be listening, don't know how this works, but underneath there, there's a little lighter that's going on at all times. There's a little light and it's lit mm -hmm. all the time. You just don't see it, right? And yeah. I feel like that's, that's our soul. That's, that's who we are. And for whatever reason, mine, well, for a lot of reasons that I've just shared, mine was flickering and almost out. Right? Mm -hmm. And I felt mm -hmm. like I needed to reignite that pilot light and reignite my human spirit. So from that uh, day, uh, not that it was overnight by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, it's, it's uh, 2022. It's almost, uh, it's almost, it's about a decade later or more. And I'm yes. still working through things, right? I, I'm still working through things. A lot of it, I, I it took about seven years really to really get um, myself back to really an empowered state. But I mean, mm. there's still things that I'm working through around that, that whole traumatic experience for me. So uh, fast forward, you know, I, a lot of things I will leave out here, but I will share some of the relevant uh, details. You know, I, I started to go deeper into my own personal development and discover what did I value? What are the things that I'm really great at? What is my unique sort of flow, if you will? Uh, yes. Your flow concept, I, I like to call that your path of least resistance, right? It's, um, it's that thing, that intersection between what you do really well and what lights you up, right? Mm -hmm. You know you're in the flow because it gives you life. Yes. Right? You know you're in the flow because it gives you life. It gives you energy. And one of the things that I discovered, and it was actually through working with my very first mentor in that very first business that I talked about, before I crashed and burned, he saw something in me around uh, speaking, around being out with people. And yeah. he would just put the microphone in my hand and just say, go. And, and he would ask me questions. He would just put me on the spot, right? Mm. And he saw in me an, a, a potential that I did not know was there. And that was to be someone that could empower others uh, with my voice. Yeah. And so... Uh, fast forward through a, a lot of stories there, which we can unpack later if you fit, see fit. Yes. But ultimately, I discovered my passion. One of my passions was to uh, to move people through mm -hmm. sharing stories and through uh, sharing my challenges and, and my triumphs. And hopefully people can see in themselves uh, a similar experience and they can extrapolate from what I share something meaningful to help them move past a challenge, help them to overcome that failure and the subsequent fear and doubt that emerges from that failure. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately the basis of my work uh, really centers around empowering and enabling the courage and the confidence to overcome that failure, that fear, that yeah. doubt, so yeah. that we can start to live our dream life, whatever that is for us. Right, so that we can start to live and feel fully alive. And along that journey of putting mm -hmm. myself in these challenging places of getting on the microphone and, and stepping up and hiring coaches and investing money and, and growing myself, I discovered that not only was uh, I on a, on a mission to reignite my human spirit, but my purpose was re revealed to me, Michael, and that is to reignite the human spirit right? Yeah. Reignite the human spirit in as many people as I possibly can. So that led me to uh, becoming a professional keynote speaker uh, where I've spoken all around the world. I've actually spoken in the UK several times. That was one of my, one of my bread and butters before Corona. Uh, I would come over mm. to England once or twice a year and uh, deliver keynotes to different organizations, whether it be universities uh, or corporations or a lot of entrepreneur groups. It was kind yes. of my sweet spot. Uh, leadership groups, and ultimately led me to uh, coaching other entrepreneurs who want to speak, who want to have that world-class ability to impact others with their yes. message, 
Uh, and that, that was my business for the last few years. So we're kind of bringing back up to speed. Hopefully this is valuable okay. to Very valuable. I've got more to share, but I'll, I'll come back on what I'm doing right now, which uses a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. Perfect. Perfect. So thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you. The, there were quite a few questions that came up for me. Okay. And the one question that I'm really curious about is when you discovered at the point when you said, I failed my intuition, I had yeah. all these messages, messages, and I ignored them. Yeah. And for whatever reason, you know, it might have been greed, it might have been other reasons that you ignored those things. How did you, because most of us, when we realize that actually the person who did it all <laughs> was me, yeah. we start beating ourselves up, right? We go, see, I, see, it was me after all. I'm just a failure. I'm no good. I can't do anything mm. else now. You know, I, if I do something else, I'm going to fail again. You know, so all this negative self-talk that we have inside of us, yeah limiting beliefs and everything how did you overcome that so how did i overcome the limiting beliefs mm. Mm. it's a good question um <clears throat> i would say the the biggest thing that in that moment of feeling like you know what it was michael i don't know that i even knew at the time what my limiting belief was. I mean, I obviously had the, I guess, a belief, or it was more of a thought that, mm. that my intuition failed me. But it was really more of a, a, a building back trust with my intuition, right? right? Really going inward to uh, share, I want to share a little bit more about the black sheep habits. And this, this is really great for anyone out there who is in a place where they're feeling stuck or they're feeling like they um, maybe have a limiting belief. Mm. <clears throat> and that is to really um, do these four things. Okay. The first thing is to, uh, to, to uh, meditate, right? Meditation. We talked a little bit about that. It has a great way to, and it's proven out there. If you Google it now, it's a lot more mainstream yes. mindfulness and meditation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, scientific research around it as well. The, the powerful benefits that it has on our well-being, on our health, literally, um, and on the clarity of what's important to us. So mm. think of meditation almost as a sort of quieting of the mind <clears throat> where all the, if you have muddy water, where all that mud or that dirt kind of settles down to the bottom and now you can see clearly, right? Yeah. And from there, uh, what I like to do is I like to then go out in nature, as I mentioned, take walks in nature by yourself yeah. and yeah. contemplate. And what happens a lot of times when we uh, have that settling of our thoughts, um, we then go out in nature and now it allows that thought, the right thought to emerge back up. And you can right. actually see it now because it's clear. Right? Yes. You can see it because it's clear. And that, so that's the second black sheep habit. So it's meditation. And then contemplation walks in nature. And then another great thing to do is to journal, right? So mm. let's say you come back from that walk, let's journal. And some of these things, when I've heard them, I was just like, journal, I don't know, I'm going to journal. Like, that's kind of cheesy, but, but it's actually really a great thing to do because we, I don't want to get too brainy, too, too psychological, but um, I tend to think very psychologically. I have a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in organizational psychology. And I've been geeking out on neuroscience and the human condition and, you know, what drives and motivates us for the last like 15 or 20 years. So I'm not the foremost mm. expert in the world, but I know more than I guess the average person. So I tend to look at things through uh, a, a psychological lens. And so um, when, and I said all that to say something in particular, mm talking about meditation and then contemplation. Oh, and then journaling. journaling. Yeah. yeah, journaling. When we, uh, when we uh, uh, have 
a great thought, an inspired thought. A lot of times there's a part of our brain, and I'm out, again, I don't want to get too scientific here. That's not necessary. There's a part of our brain that kind of doesn't want that to happen. Yeah. Right? Our ego like doesn't really want that to happen. And I don't mean our ego like we're being macho or anything like that, or we think we're better. I mean, it's a part of our brain, right? That where we we it really wants us to be safe. It's trying to protect us. And sometimes it can misdiagnose opportunity, something that can be a little bit scary. It can misdiagnose it or mislabel it as danger when really it's just fear, right? So we got to be careful with that. We got to be careful with that. So when we journal things, the reason why it's so important is because if our part of our brain doesn't really want us to necessarily be fully self-expressed and the biggest version of ourselves and go out there and do these awesome, amazing things, it'll probably allow that amazing thought that came up in contemplation to vanish quickly. Yeah. So we want to grab it and we want to write it down because unfortunately, a lot of times it will vanish and maybe it'll come back up six months later and you're like, oh, wow, I thought of that before. Why did I not do anything with that? Well, it's because Mm -hmm. you didn't write it down. Mm. Right. You didn't document it. So that's why a long way of saying journaling is important. Uh, so that's the third one, journaling. And then I find that when we're able to quiet our minds through meditation and then through contemplation, allow ideas to emerge. And then through journaling, we can start to see patterns, even if it's not clear right out the gate what there is to do. Keep doing it. Yes. And you'll start to see patterns and you'll start to see opportunities emerge from there. When you get clear about what it is you want, we then want to employ the granddaddy or grandmommy of them all, uh, of all, I believe, black sheep habits. And it's something that, you know, fighter pilots do this, um, uh, the top entrepreneurs, top, top athletes, uh, some of the most successful people that have the, the greatest results in their chosen fields in the world do this fourth one. And you probably can guess what it is, but I'm going to share it right now. And that is visualization, Mm. right? We have to visualize what it is that we actually want. And I know this sounds a little, little goofy, perhaps if you're not, or you're new to personal growth and development, if you're not new to it, you're probably like, yep, that's a good reminder. I got to do that. Um, There's a lot of science around this as well. Uh, And there's a great, great story. Michael Phelps, who is, uh, arguably the greatest Olympian of all time. Maybe it's not arguable. He has a lot of medals. He has like 27 or 28 medals and 23 of them are gold. It's pretty crazy. He's a swimmer for the US. And he says that he would work out before the Olympics uh, seven days a week for eight hours a day, 24, literally 365 a year, every year for four years leading up to the Olympics. That's like every day for eight hours. That's crazy. Mm. And he said, even with all that working out, he said, visualization was his secret weapon. Mm. Visualization was his secret weapon. In fact, there's this great interview we did with Forbes where he talks about, I think it was the 2008 Olympics. I don't remember exactly. It doesn't matter, but he was doing the butterfly crazy hard stroke. Right. And he said, uh, I think it was eight times back and forth. I'm not a huge swimmer, so I don't know the exact details, but it was through one lap his goggles filled up with chlorine after one only one so like one eighth of the way through yeah. goggles completely filled up couldn't see a thing he said he swam the entire rest of that race blind and not only did he win gold he set a world record because he had raced that race thousands of times already in his mind and he won every single time in his mind, right? So there's such power in, and I just got the chills even thinking about this. It reminds me too, me, I yeah. Need to visualize again. Mm-hmm. It, it is such a powerful practice when you start to employ it. And it's so important to not just visualize it, but he would literally visualize uh, and, and experience, internalize the smell of the chlorine, right? Mm-hmm. The feel of the water on his feet, walking down, you know, the, the edge of the pool, literally being on the blocks, hearing the, the whistle go off or the, 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 the noise go off that uh, signifies him to jump in the pool. Every stroke, every kick, every turn, every breath, all the way to the feeling that he would feel when he's standing on the podium 
receiving the gold medal. And the feeling that he would feel was the most important thing that he would experience in that visualization process. Yeah. So again, lots of science around that. If you want to Google it, check it out. They do this well, for there's a, pilots. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing practice. It It is. And yeah, it's a great reminder. Thank you. I must do yeah. more of it. But I remember when this first started being exposed to me yeah. was around, I think it must have been 2005 or 2006, when a movie came out, like a docu-movie that was one of the first ones, even before The Secret. Yeah. And it was, and it's called What the Bleep Do We yes. Know? I own it. And I remember, rem- yeah, it's when I saw that, and I saw it in, in like a private cinema. It was mm-hmm. like on a very limited release, like literally two days. And you could see it in like a private, almost private cinema. And it wasn't like on national release or anything. Right. And I went with a bunch of friends, like minded friends, and we watched it. And I remember a clip in that documentary movie where they said that they'd wired somebody up to you know brain monitors and all these patches and on their muscles as well and this person was visualizing this they did this to athletes they were visualizing running like the 100 meters or 200 meters um presumably you'd call them yards (laughs) but they they realized not only was the brain lighting up as if they were running the muscles activated as well and this Mm -hmm. person was sitting still um and i remember when i first started teaching myself how to do public speaking Mm. that I had to do, this was through Toastmasters, American organization in the UK. And I had to be there like on a Monday evening, whatever. And I was going to do my first seven minute talk. And the subject was easy. It was me, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember driving to work. I was employed at the time of driving to work, rehearsing this seven minute talk in my head. The journey was like an hour long to get to work. And I was feeling butterflies in my stomach. I wasn't even driving to the event to speak. I was driving to work. I was nowhere near it. And I was feeling butterflies in my stomach. And I went, this is mad. Hmm. My brain is stupid or really, really clever. Because now my brain thinks I'm actually doing the talk in front of everybody. And I'm already feeling the adrenaline inside of my body taking place. And that, to me, at that moment in time, when you talk about intuition and messages and science, that, to me, having watched What the Bleep and and watched that clip about muscles firing and the brain firing and everything, when you just visualize, that visualization of doing the talk, I felt it in my body. I felt that it was real. And that's what convinced me that it works. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we could that we could literally do a whole conversation just on that one topic. I know, and, I know. You know, as you start to, besides priming your brain for success, which ultimately is what we're doing with visualization, we're also creating our awareness to, or, or we're, we're developing our awareness in our brain to notice things in our environment that were already there before. A lot of times we talk about the law of attraction. We talk about attracting. It's not like it just happens. Like, like we just, and I don't want to go too deep down this rabbit hole, but it's not like all of a sudden we're a magnet and things start just coming to us automatically. Although I think there is an element of that. There definitely is because like attracts like, but I also think that part of it is if you think about it for more of our brainy people that are more like scientific in the approach, you could think of it like this because that, that is happening by the way. I want to discount the attraction. It is happening. But what also is happening is there are, and they talk about this in What the Bleep Do You Know, the the movie, there's millions and millions and millions of scenarios happening all at the same time and millions of bits of information, billions of bits of information that are going on all around us at any given time. Yes. And our brain, so as to not go crazy bonkers, 
has to uh, distort, delete, and generalize a lot of what's going on to focus in on just a few key things that are happening around us. And I know this sounds bonkers, but this is literally science. Um, and it literally, what determines the things that we see are, is our belief system. It's almost like a filter or a lens. Think of a lens, like glasses, certain colored glasses. It allows us to see certain things that are happening. And that is why you could have two people that have very different backgrounds that experience the same exact thing standing right in front of you. And one of them can say, wow, what a tragedy. And the other one can say, wow, what an opportunity. It's yes. just all through the lens through which we're seeing the world. And that of course is dictated by what happened in our past and how aware we are and, and how much we dig into our own personal awareness. So again, I don't want to get too crazy. I think I just did go down that rabbit hole a little bit, <laughs> yes. but there's a lot of things happening. We're just not noticing the right things. And when we become I aware know. through visualization, all of a sudden we start to see them everywhere. It's kind of like the reticular activator, like part of your brain where you get the little shiny red car and you think you're all unique. And all of a sudden you see everybody and their mother has the same car. You're like, yes, they were already there. They were there the whole time, always already there. Yes. But you just didn't notice them because you weren't Focus and aware of them. Mm. That mm. makes sense. Yeah, hundred percent. So. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, really appreciate that. Okay, so I really love those four things. Thank you very much. They are just awesome things that people really need to harness if they can. Yeah. So um, you paused. I asked you a question. We went to these four things. Where? How would you like to carry on with your story? So yeah, I would love to just share kind of. And it's an example of me experiencing all those things and the fear and the intuition and the do I do a lot of you out there probably uh, have an intuition or a feeling like I want to start a business or I want to grow to the next level and maybe yes. something yeah. stopping you. Uh, because where where I was at, and this has happened to me a couple of times in my life where I've, I've really, you know, found a place to found a way to have a pretty decent amount of success in what I was doing. And, and specifically uh, in, for me, it was speaking and yes. coaching people how to speak. And you would think, Oh, he's got it figured out. He's just going to keep doing that and keep growing that. And there's an opportunity to grow. And, 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 but I had an intuition. I had an intuition that, wait a minute, that's not it. That's not all there is. Yes. I'll continue to speak. Yes. Uh, I will continue to coach. In fact, I still do coach uh, a, a group in a mastermind for speaking, but I'm not actively going out seeking that anymore because I had an intuition and that intuition, Michael, was to live my message. And mm -hmm. my message has been to live courageously for years. And I feel like I've continually done that, but it started to take a, a more focused uh, shape, if you will, in the last few years around living your dream life. Like, like, what is it that you really want to experience in life? How, what makes you feel most alive? And for my wife and I, it had always been travel, right? And that's one of the things I really love about speaking is I get to travel around the world and speak and it's been really fun, uh, but it wasn't everything. It wasn't, wasn't everything I was looking for. So travel is one. And then two, uh, I wanted to be more active. And I was looking for something that my wife and I could do together that was active, that was exercise, but it didn't feel like exercise. Cause I don't know about you, but I don't really like to exercise personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I like how it makes me feel when I do, uh, but yes. I like to have fun. So mm. I, I picture this, I'm in a dentist appointment and I'm laying in the chair and all of a sudden I hear this pop, 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 pop. It's like popcorn going on outside. I was like, what is that? So I walk outside afterwards, I walk down uh, the road and I look through around this fence and I see all these people smiling and laughing and playing and uh, older people, younger people, in shape people, out of shape people, all different types. And they're having so much fun. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And they <laughs> said, it's pickleball. <laughs> yes, folks, I said it. It's pickleball. <laughs> now, a lot of you are like, pickle, what? Like, what is this guy talking about? Pickleball. Think like tennis and table tennis or ping pong. Yes. Think about if tennis and ping pong had a baby and it's a really cool baby. Okay? <laughs> baby. It, it's 
it's like a it's a it's it's a paddle sport uh it's not like a racket with strings it's a paddle it's hard and you play with a, a ball that's plastic that's similar to like a wiffle ball i don't know if you have wiffle balls in the uk with the holes in them a lot of times you hit them with yes. a bat it's yeah. kind of like a wiffle ball but it's a little harder a little more uniform with the holes and it's played on a court like a hard court outdoor or indoor that is about a quarter of the size of a tennis court and right. it's usually two on two but you can play one on one and it is so fun it is literally the fastest growing sport in the u.s it's blowing up all around the world it's been around since 1965 uh, but nobody really knew about it except most of the older generation, the 60 plus, 65 plus. That's kind right. of where it was popularized amongst that crowd. But over the last several years, the, the average age has dropped tremendously uh, because there's now a pro tour. There's a junior tour, a pro tour. Uh, there's a major league pickleball. I actually commentate for uh, Pickleball Night in America here in Austin for the pro matches. Uh, so, so then that's, I'm going to come back to that in a sec. Yes. Why I'm doing that. Yeah. So I find pickleball and it, it le absolutely, uh, totally emerged during COVID. We found it August 15th. Uh, I believe COVID was 2019, 2019. Yeah. 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020. Yeah. Thank you. Well, so, it yeah. did start in 2019, but in China, right. I think the Western world yeah. got it. Big time 2020. 2020. Correct. Yeah. So pickleball blew up because it was a sport where in a team, you have to be about six feet apart and you're outdoors and you're active and it's incredibly social. People that play this sport are highly addicted. So I warn you, if you play anyone that's watching and yourself as well or listening, yes, uh, go try it because you will quickly become addicted to it. It is so social and you'll meet some of the coolest people. Uh, my wife and I uh, have met some of the, some of our best friends actually playing pickleball and some great acquaintances as well. So there's pickleball all of a sudden in our yes. lives and we yeah. are totally fired up. I feel alive again. And I realized later on, in fact, I only realized this about a month ago. Okay. So over a year into playing pickleball, I realized why it means so much to me. I'm all about inspiring greatness i'm all about reigniting my own human spirit and reigniting the human spirit right through my actions yes. and my words and what i realized is i had a lim another limiting belief and it was in high school i tore my acl actually as a kid even before then skiing and then playing football uh, american football tore my acl total reconstruction college playing basketball in a pickup game total reconstruction of my acl and my left knee so at 21 years of age, Michael, I don't know if anyone can relate to something like this, but 21 years of age, I went from 21 to 45. So 24 years of my life believing, but totally unconscious, like I yes. didn't even know it was a belief that mm. my competitive life was over. It's just right. what's so, it's what's so, right? What's so, it's how life is for me. It's just, I was totally resigned didn't even give it any thought like there wasn't ever a possibility of me doing anything active no, all i could do no. was hike and then my knees would hurt eventually but i could hike and i could swim if i want to i'm not a big swimmer that's it nothing yeah. else competitive and i literally when i started playing pickleball i felt this rush of aliveness come back to my body my mind my soul and it absolutely was the first time in a very, very long time, 24 years that I actually felt like it was possible for me to not only uh, be active in a competitive sport, but to actually compete in tournaments, which wow. I have subsequently done and won medals. And, and it's, it's, so it, it actually, it brought me life. It brought wow. me life. So currently uh, uh, well, I want to come back to that really quick, but what happened was that happened. And then I had this feeling like, wow, I want to go live my passion of travel and now pickleball. Yeah. So my mm. wife decided to rent out our house. We were going to go overseas and just go and just go and just go and just go and live overseas and just keep going. And we're both entrepreneurs, so we could potentially do that. But then COVID happens. So what mm. we decided to do is we bought a 36 foot motorhome and we rented out our house and we sold a lot of things very quickly. And we just went. I don't oh. to, it didn't happen very quickly. It took about a year to do all this. But then we took off and we took off almost a year ago now. And we just started traveling. We bought a Jeep. 
We're towing the Jeep. We were literally living and driving <laughs> in our house. Uh, we've been all around the, the U.S. so far. We've been to like 13, I think 13 or, or 10 uh, national parks. We've played pickleball with so many amazing people in so many states. And I, I declared at first I was just going to continue to speak and do my coaching business. And then mm. I decided, I declared that, you know what, I have this intuition that I'm supposed to be doing something in pickleball. I'm right. supposed to be doing something in pickleball. And the more I learned about pickleball, the more I, I learned that it actually has been proven that it does increase your self-confidence. It increases your self-esteem, your mental awareness, your focus. There's a socialization aspect to it that it, 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 it uh, um, uh, lowers uh, anyone that has depression. It helps them. Uh, depression, anxiety. So there's a lot of psychological and emotional and obviously physical benefits to playing pickleball yes. that have been proven. So I'm like, wow, of course, that's why I love this sport, because not only does it make me feel alive and reignite my human spirit, but I can now utilize this sport to help empower other people that maybe are in that challenging space to get out and play pickleball, because yes. it does lift your emotional, mental, emotional, and physical well-being. So I have subsequently declared that, and literally we're in the throngs of it right now, Michael, and I'm almost, this will be the conclusion of my story here, but I, I literally in the last uh, three months have created opportunities to become a professional pickleball commentator, which I never thought was even, that wasn't even on the table. I never even thought right. of that. I just knew I wanted to inspire people. I wanted to be inspired and I wanted to make money getting paid to play, ultimately yes. getting paid to play. And yeah. that's one of my declaration statements for my wife and I, another whole story of writing down your values and your, your statement for your five-year commitments and goals. Uh, but ultimately that's happened in the last, I've literally been commentating for the last month and a half here in Austin at one of the top pickleball places in the country. And I created my, my second pickleball event, ultimately, uh, that supports charity. Uh, and it's actually a tournament here that's coming up uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. It's called the Pickleball for Life, the number four, Pickleball for Life Memorial Day Challenge. And I just started coaching people one-on-one -on -one because I became a certified pickleball coach in December. So like all of these things are starting to happen because mm. I believe that it was possible. I had no idea what it was going to look like. I just had the courage. I had the intuition. And then I trusted in that intuition, knowing yes. that well, if I can see it, it's possible. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I just started taking actions. And in spite of my fear, which is the definition yeah. of courage, right, taking action in spite of fear and being very present to what showed up and being a yes being a yes, thinking big, saying yes, and then taking action, right? And magic and miracles have, have happened. Now, do I have it all figured out? Am I making the level of income that I would like to make? No. Am I doing everything that I would like to do? No. Is it all perfect? No. But are things unfolding in a very beautiful way, uh, utilizing the laws of the universe that kind of we've been talking about throughout here without really naming some of them, but ultimately, yes. It has. And that's what I would invite anyone out there who's listening uh, to do as well, is to, you know, have that vision of what's possible. And if you don't know what that is, do the four black sheep habits, right? To yes. get clear, meditate, yeah. contemplate, journal, and then visualize. And then we have to have through that inspiration, right? The inspiration, we have to have belief that it's possible because we already saw it in our intuition. We have to have faith that it's already done. Right? I'm not yeah. talking about religious faith or even spiritual faith, although that will definitely help you. But I'm just talking about that, like that, like blind faith, like it's done. Like there's no other possible way. It's already done. And then all mm -hmm. we have to do is have courage and take action. So it's inspiration plus belief in faith plus action equals magic and miracles. Magic and miracles will show up in your life if we allow them to. Fantastic. That sounds awesome. And I have a few questions about pickleball. <laughs> yes, please. A really, really stupid question. You say it's a smaller chord compared to a tennis chord, a hard chord. 
But do people play it on a tennis court, but just change the lines on it or? A lot of times, yeah. Uh, there's kind of a joke in the U.S. that we're making tennis courts great again. Uh, kind of a play on something else. But yeah, so the, the, a lot of people play tennis, right? I mean, it's a mm. very popular sport, obviously. But what you're finding is there's so many tennis courts, especially here in the U.S. and really all around the world, they're just left unused. Mm. And so, yeah, one of the great ways to uh, revitalize communities, bring more people out into parks, uh, and of course, help uplift in our communities, uplift the mental, emotional, mm. physical well-being of our communities is to draw lines. They are new lines. You can usually fit about, uh, I don't know the exact number, depending on how it goes, two to four. It's about four. You can fit four if you do it perfectly, but it's not going to be a lot of room. So probably three yeah. pickleball courts per tennis, and you have to have a different style net. It's a lower right. net. Lower yeah. net. And yeah. does the ball not bounce? No, it bounces. It does it bounce. bounces. Yeah, right. it's a plastic ball that bounces. And wow. it's a very, very fast paced game. The ball, you're only seven feet away from the net. And the other person is seven feet. You can't go in that section. It's called the kitchen, unless the ball bounces. Too many rules here. But ultimately, yeah, what yeah. I'm saying is the ball can come back at you very, very quickly. So it's very, very fast paced. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I definitely need to find a video to see it i've never seen it in my life just i've never google, heard of it even google professional pickleball and it yeah. will astound you at on, on go on youtube it'll astound you at how professional it is and how fast yes. paced and, and what's possible now when you watch professional pickleball it's not all like that you won't start out like that and you might no. not ever get to that level yes. but it just shows you what's possible and how exciting it really is Right. Um, and then okay. there's a great uh, website that is um, it's part of uh, pickleball uh, um, USA pickleball dot org is kind of the governing body uh, right. here in the US. And each country has their own. But that's the one I know here. And then places and the number two play dot I think it's dot org or dot com. Just two place shows you places all around the world. Oh, really? where there's courts. Yeah, there's wow. public courts, there's private courts, there's paid courts, there's free courts. And speaking of that, I just want to explain the Pickleball for Life. Pickleballforlife.org is my website, one of my websites. Mm. And the reason why I chose Pickleball for Life is again, I had it. This is when I had that intuition. I literally yes. woke up one day and I was like, Pickleball for Life. And I was like, yes, because I'm going to be playing Pickleball for the rest of my life. I literally play with 80 year olds, Michael, and they kick my butt sometimes. <laughs> and I first, when you first start playing pickleball, you're most likely going to play with some older people. You might already mm. be older. That's fine too. You're going to probably play with some out of shape people as well. And they're going to kick your butt and you're going to be like, what the heck? Like, why, <laughs> how is this possible? But that's what happens. They just stand there. They know how to hit the ball and they don't need to move a lot. So they're all good. So pickleball for life, you can literally play this for the rest of your life. Okay. So that's obviously one of the meanings, but the more deeper meaning for me, Michael, is that again, I, it brought such life to me when I started playing pickleball and I am now utilizing pickleball to help bring life to others, right? With the pickleball for life Memorial day challenge, we're supporting mental health awareness and NAMI uh, in central Texas here. It's a national uh, charity, National Alliance on Mental Illness. We're bringing awareness to that in the month of May with Mental Health Awareness Month and really providing resources to the community. And we're also shining a light on pickleball as a tool to also improve uh, your mental health. Yeah. So pickleball for life for me means that pickleball gives life to people. And that's why I chose that as my brand at pickleballforlife.org. Wow. Sounds incredible. That sounds great. Uh, awesome. Well done. Congratulations. It's Thank a you. great story about how you just, you know, got up out of the dentist chair, heard this noise, and checked it out, and your intuition kicked in after that. And yeah. where you are now in terms of that experience. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It's a wonderful example of how it can happen. If people want to get hold of you for yeah. any of the things that you do, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, thank you so much for asking, Michael. If, if people would like me to potentially speak on their podcast or for their organization, 
uh, or, or a company, they can go to clintonyoung.com. That is my speaker website. However, what I'm really excited about is the RV and pickleball tour that we're on right now. So if anyone else is excited about that and also wants to follow along, they can follow me. I'm gonna give two handles. Mm. Uh, my, my speaker handle that I do a lot of, uh, a, lot, a lot of things on there, you can check it out on Instagram and Facebook is at Clinton Speaks. And perhaps we'll put that in the show notes. So yes, at Clinton Speaks. And then my wife and I, our journey uh, with the RV, that is at Club Freedom Live. That's Club Freedom Live. So I know Brilliant. I gave you four things. There's That's perfect. Clintonyoung.com <laughs> is my speaker and at Clinton Speaks. Yes. And then there's uh, pickleballforlife.org and uh, at Club Freedom Live is my social media handle. For some That's perfect. Things. They'll all be in the show notes and more. Cool. So if people struggle, I'm sure they'll be able to get hold of you. Clinton, thank you so much. I, I really do hope you come to the UK and show me where, how to play pickleball one day. I would love uh, to. Let's coordinate. <laughs> yeah, because I'm going to definitely look to see where, where this is. Really, really quick, funny story yeah. is that I've just started about a couple of months ago, started playing badminton that mm. I, hadn't, I hadn't played oh, for ever, like a long, long time. I never played a lot. I just played casually now and again, and I'm playing against older people and they are kicking my butt. Um, yes. you know, <laughs> so I know exactly what you mean with, uh, because they've been playing badminton for years and they were professionals at some point and they're like 80 years old, 80 years old plus, and they are literally kicking my butt. So I can well imagine that pickleball yeah. is the same <laughs> uh, in that respect. So, yeah, I look forward to, to that experience. R great speaking with you. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, please do keep in touch. If you do come to the UK, do let me know. We'll meet up uh, and coordinate. And a great story. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so, so much for having me. Just want to remind everybody to think big, say yes, and take action. Thanks so much, Michael. Awesome. Take care. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.